and welcome back to another episode of Adventuring Academy. I'm your humble dungeon master, Brentley Mulligan. This is Dimension 20 Show, where we talk about the theory and practice of tabletop gaming with luminaries in the field from far and wide. Today, we couldn't be more excited to have our amazing guest with us to talk about all things gaming. Uh, you know her, you love her. She's the host of Tea with Honey. She contributed to the latest DM Guild book, Fun Sized, and is the creator and host of the Embrace the Initiative series of GM and DM workshops. She is a motivational speaker, game master, storyteller, charity live streamer, a cybersecurity specialist. Ooh, badass. You know her, you love her. You might be familiar with her uh, under the, the credit and appellation of DT Saint uh, from voiceover work. But we are welcome to welcome her to the, the podcast today, Honey! <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you let me know if it was too much. You let me that, know. That, that was that was good. I could hear the hype music in the background. Good. You know, you We're just need a pair of shades. Exactly, a pair of shades. We're going to get to the point where we mail guests on Adventuring Academy a big sheet of paper with their face on it to jump through at the beginning of the <laughs> vodcast. Um we're, we're, that's in the worst. COVID kind of put a, a little bit of a hitch in that plan. But we are so excited to have you today on the show. Honey, thanks so much for coming and being a part of the show with us. You're welcome. I'm surprised, but happy to be here. Of, well, we are not surprised at all. Um, uh, we are delighted to have you. And uh, uh, to sort of kick us off for a sec here and talking a little bit about uh, uh, embrace the initiative and the kind of work you've been doing. Uh, how long have you been running games for? <laughs> so this question always makes me laugh um, because I was reading from the age of three and I say that to preface it, I didn't know how to play pretend right. I didn't know that play pretend did not have like, here is the central theme, here are all of our characters, this is the story we're going to tell. That's how I played pretend from a very young age. And people kept playing with me. Um, but we had storylines, we had seasons, you know, people would be like, well, I want to be a fire breathing, you know, monkey. I'm like, that's not this setting. This is science. <laughs> this is, that's not possible. Um, so you and, so there, there would be other little children on the playground and kind of running around with juice on their hands. And you would walk in with like a binder, a cup of coffee, yeah. being like, <laughs> okay, guys, uh, I've been looking over some of your guys' suggestions. I feel like we're way off of the same page. I don't know what's going on. I hope you guys read the Bible and the yeah. thematic package I sent out. Um, so... <laughs> you really I... call me out that close, but yeah. <laughs> um... But yeah, that, that's how it started. And then when I started to get online and I saw that there were systems where there could be boundaries in place outside of me saying, no, stop. Um, but there were dice and systems and mechanics. And I love puzzles and putting things together. And I was like, this is pretty cool. Um, and I was that nerd who had a dice rolling script in their chat programs. Um, you know, used to you know, joke around and rap and say, like, I have a dice rolling script in my IRC DM when I can after 10 p.m. Like, I had, that was just, that was the epitome of my cool. So I've been running them for a while, um, mostly in, like, text-based formats during most of my teenage years because of traveling. Um, started doing them in person, um, a few years ago because people wanted to learn how to play um, and then got dragged online because I found out people were doing charity streams um, and they're like hey do you know how to play and I was like I've played them before and they said well do you know how to play D&D &D? and I said N no but I can learn <laughs> um, and then I just started to do that and then somehow I got tricked into running games online uh, well, we're delighted that you were thus tricked, um, uh, uh, because, uh, uh, the work that you're doing is really, really awesome. And I certainly wanted to, I do want to move us to talking about Embrace the Initiative, uh, because I want to talk about what, like, 
this is such a great overlap in terms of what we try to do on Adventuring Academy of talking about the game and how it's played and the fact that you really do run workshops for people that want to get their sea legs underneath them in terms of running games. But I do actually want to take a detour and talk about the text-based role-playing you did <laughs> because even though I've never had a dice script running in my chats, I was I was I did not have the technical wizardry to figure out how to do that. Um, I spent a tremendous amount of time in my teenage years doing text-based role-playing, sometimes mm -hmm. totally free form, other times with some kind of loose system or something along those lines. But um, I feel like, like, especially as a teenager, pre-car years, pre-being yeah. able to get around, uh, things like AIM and like RPG, like message boards and things like that were a huge way when you're trapped in your parents' home to like engage with your fellow teens. Um, uh, how did you come across discovering that that, that sort of space? And um, do you think that you like developed any skills from those text-based adventures early on that would later translate when you moved to like more formal systems? Also, what systems were you playing with in those rooms? Um, so I started, before I started doing dice rolling, it was just free form. It mm -hmm. was, you know, the forums, the Envision, all that extra stuff, you know, all of those <laughs> behind the scenes um, thing. And it had started because I was going to move to another country and my play pretend friends and I wanted to stay in touch. And so I had figured out how to build a forum and we were still trying to tell some stories that way. Then I kind of verged off and found that there were whole communities doing that. Um, and I just fell in 100 just fell in love with collaborative storytelling um, and loving to write because I used to do poetry competitions and things like that. So getting to do that with other people um, was exciting. Um, probably showing how much of a nerd I am here by saying that the text-based games that used to play in the Telnet <laughs> clients <laughs> um, <laughs> fell into that world pretty heavy. Um, and it's just one step further down the road of really loving not only collaborative storytelling, but the mechanics aspect of it as well. So um, for me, it was getting those creative outlets to yeah. tell stories with other people um, and to like, I didn't have a lot of video games. I, I grew up in the household. When I say a lot, I mean, I didn't have any video games, um, not a lot of TV, you know, um, I joke around and say, I got a block in a book. So my creativity, my imagination has always gone like a hundred miles per hour, even though I can only walk like five. Um, and so I have to get that out. And that was a way for me to get that out so that I'm not, you know, sitting there talking through conversations and situations by myself and my mother asking me concerned, who are you talking to? Nothing. It's just, I'm trying to work out this plot point, you know, um, <laughs> this has allowed me to, to, to get that out, um, and kind of discover who I am. Well, that that I definitely uh, uh, empathize with and and relate to that idea of like, especially coming across these games at a very young age and mm -hmm. using that storytelling to learn lessons about yourself, especially during a time period in your life for people that discover these games during childhood and during their teenage years, where you're, you know, it's like when you're playing these games, you're often crafting an identity for yourself, which is, you know, pretty on the nose metaphor for what being a teenager or being a young person often is. You're literally crafting your identity. You may, mm -hmm. may not feel that way at the time, but you're figuring out what kind of person you want to be. Um, for that experience going into that, I love what you said here too, because um, there is a tendency uh, in in Dungeons and Dragons circles and gaming circles more broadly, that like storytelling and mechanics are somehow somehow like opposed or in conflict with each other. And I personally have never agreed with that because uh, there's nothing I love more than dramatic collaborative storytelling. 
And there's nothing I love more than deep mechanics lore and the crunch and the idea of what a game is designed to be able to do. Um, so what I love is you talking about like the discovery of these mechanics as being an aid to storytelling. Um, uh, when you think about like moving from those free form RPG chat room kind of things to then moving into like a storytelling more guided by mechanics, do you remember what that transition felt like? And in your head, like for somebody who maybe is like for whatever reason watching this and like very averse to like crunch and mechanics, like what to you was the great selling point of what mechanics allowed you to do in storytelling? So when I started to use dice systems um, in the storytelling, it was a lot of those D10 systems that were being rolled out for, you know, settings that people were already familiar with. Um, famous TV shows, book series or whatever, they would always fall up on a D10. And how I explain it to people is it provided boundaries that everyone agreed to that didn't take away from the identity of the characters. Mm -hmm. But it allowed everyone to play on an even playing field. And for me, that was super important. And for me, that was one of my steps towards being a huge proponent of safety and comfort at the table. Um, because in these freeform worlds, uh, I hate to say it, but things like consent and boundaries and all that kind of stuff is kind of timey, whiny, not really in existence, depending on the group that you're with. But if everybody has to follow the same rules when it comes to how they build their characters, then they can't say, yes, I picked your character up and threw them across the room. <laughs> without rolling for it. There there was, I think you're, you're, you're exactly on the money. I remember a lot of those like RPG message forms that were totally free form is the, within the promise of free form of like, hey, we're gonna strip away all that mechanic stuff and just leave the raw ephemera of storytelling. When you did that, all of a sudden, when conflict would arise, there was no mechanic for the mediation or resolution of that conflict. And it ended up often therefore relying on weird interpersonal power dynamics that could get really uncomfortable really quickly. And I feel like myself and my friends often left a lot of games where we'd be like, hey, the person running that game has like, brought us all our characters here to like abuse them with a series of increasingly powerful demigod exactly. villains. You know, weird, weird like power trips from from freeform GMs back in the day. So there's there's I think like that compact did often get broken. And there's something about those mechanics which counterintuitively, because you think like, hey, by inviting dice into the game, aren't we going to be inviting more conflict? And in a weird way, it's like, no, you, like, I think in some ways you're actually inviting a source of mediation mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and and an invitation for people to kind of be on their best behavior. Um, I love that. Uh, uh, and that's also, again, vibes with mm -hmm. some, I remember the amount of, like again, RPG message forum drama back when I was fourteen. Uh, yep. Yeah, very, very real. Um, uh, but so finding those those dice games, finding those D10 systems, um, uh, that's awesome. That you were finding these other non D and D dice systems back in the day. Um, uh, so you've been playing like systematized collaborative storytelling. Uh, how long were you in that world before you said you said that you found D and D when you started doing charity streaming? So that's yeah. So D and D, in and of itself, has its own history and stigma and everything. But I had somehow convinced myself because it was so popular that it was going to be the most complicated thing to learn, right? And this is from someone who had said her favorite system was like Call of Cthulhu, basic role-playing percentile dice systems. I was somehow still convinced that D&D uh, &D would be the most complicated system ever. What I think my brain switched out was it has a very long 
history, so it has very complicated lore, things people know about it and so on, but the mechanics are actually very simple. Mm -hmm. I struggle in worlds that have all of this developed history and things because I feel the pressure that these are things I should know, but I didn't spend years you know, growing up and learning these um, pantheons and these histories and these systems and all the rest of it. So it was just nothing that I ever really fell into. Um, a couple of friends from like text-based games or so on would invite me to like, we're gonna go on Skype or on Google chats and play, do you wanna roll up a character? And I'd be like, sure, this is so complicated. And I'd had some friends that you wrote a 15 page backstory for your last character. What do you mean <laughs> complicated? <laughs> um, and so, you know, I started to go in that route. And I think it's just like discovering dice systems and playing on forums and everything. It sounds weird, but that's what made me interested in cybersecurity. Whoa, very, very cool. Uh, uh, so um, uh, being in these sort of online role-playing chat forms led you to cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that as well, you know, I actually, only because we've come here very naturally, mm -hmm. uh, I would love to, uh, hold on one second. I would actually love to do to jump into a question a little bit early, and then we'll get back to the conversation. Only because this specifically uh, relates to one of the questions that we got asked. Um, this one is from Christian Stravar Jones. Thank you, Christian. Um, uh, Christian uh, writes to us. Um, a uh, huge fan of you and your work and thoughts ever since the Black AF Roundtable. Uh, I wanted to know how you balance a highly demanding tech job with the time to run a podcast and run D&D charity streams. I also work in tech and often feel like I have difficulty finding time to get enough world building, narrative planning, and game prep time for the games I run. So a uh, question for you there, uh, uh, talk a little bit about your work in tech and also how you balance that, uh, that busy schedule. So I got involved in cybersecurity because I wanted to have the experience and knowledge to help protect children online. Mm -hmm. um, I have always been told and been in situations where I am the youngest person in the room most of the time, which means when you get into the online world, there is a lot of stuff I was exposed to on all of those RPG forums and so on, younger than I should have. Um, and as my sense of awareness grew of what was wrong or what I should have known and so on, it just made me very concerned about people who were younger who would also be going through this journey of discovery and the things I wish that were in place to protect me. And I wanted to be in a position where I could somehow do that for other people. But by the time I graduated with my first degree, you know, safe search and everything had already been developed. But... <laughs> I got the opportunity because of my experience to be able to go in and help parents um, learn what's going on in different circles and how children can protect themselves online and so on. And while that's not the focus of my work, um, because I can say I'm a cybersecurity professional, they let me go to schools and so on to speak about internet safety, cyberbullying and so on because of how much of that I actually had gone through and how I know that shapes people who may have the higher IQs, may have the higher, you know, writing abilities, may be told constantly, you're gifted, you're this, you're that, and they fall into these communities at such younger ages and are preyed upon. And so that's what really inspired me to get into cybersecurity um, because of all the crap that I saw. <laughs> in those playing communities. Um, so, and what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is basically use my business degree and use my tech degree and translate frustrated developer into demanding, you know, corporate person speak and then demanding corporate speak into frustrated developer and a lot of enterprise, enterprise architect work in knowing what's happening in the community so people can build the safeties, the safest systems possible for whatever mm -hmm. their business needs are. Um, 
how do I balance it? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, and but I, the 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 question was about balancing the sort of demanding mm -hmm. tech job, but also, first of all, this incredibly noble undertaking the the in terms of talking about the work that you do there, which yeah, I think is like you know I I think about like the uh, the wild west internet aim you know AOL instant messenger world that I was just frivolously gallivanting in as a kid and how deeply <laughs> not okay you know so you have that horrifying thing as an adult where you're like oh yeah I had that messed up thing happen and then you think about it from the adult perspective and you're like oh that was completely unacceptable that I was that 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 was going on in my life when I was a kid um, but uh, it's uh, kudos to you for uh, being in such a noble line of work and working to uh, prevent those types of things from happening. Um, and yeah, I think our friend here from, from the Discord is asking uh, specifically when you have like a work that sounds like not only as demanding on just a work level, but also as important as the work you're doing, balancing that with like projects that you're passionate about, balancing that with your own personal storytelling, your desire to play these games. I'm going to start that answer by saying accepting that no is an affirmative is the best way to keep balance. Um, I went through that phase and I think everybody goes through that phase where you're scared to say no because you don't want to come across as um, standoffish or you don't want to be a part of something and so on. But sometimes a no is just a not right now because you know what's already on your plate. And, you know, one of my whole little messages is the love your you. Well, if you are overburdening burdening your, I'm creating words here, caffeine. If you're putting too much on yourself um, and you're becoming exhausted and you're burning out, that's not self-love. Mm -hmm. So I had to learn how to say no. I had to learn to tell people, let me look at my schedule. And I will look at my my nine to five schedule a month out. Mm -hmm. I will see what meetings do I know I have on what days? Is there any demanding projects that are coming up that I know it's going to wipe me? Mm -hmm. And then I'll say, okay, this is the time I have available. I can stream two to three nights in a week. But if I try to do anything more than that, I know it's going to burn me out personally. Yeah. You know? um, so time management, um, having a schedule, and learning how to say no. Because I say, there's no yes without a no, you know. Um, yeah. So I've never, I've learned as an adult to see no as an affirmative. Um I love that. I think that's so, that is such a, the, yeah, that is not only like an acceptable answer, but actually a desired answer to have someone's no is an affirmative to be like, I am glad that we have this boundary in place. I'm glad that I know that you are advocating for what you are capable of doing. Um, I think that's incredibly healthy and a wonderful perspective. Um, uh, so I think that's excellent advice. Uh, and speaking of great advice in terms of like people that are interested in doing the same type of work, people that maybe again like like we're saying uh, are tr like most people, like ninety nine percent of people who play these games are trying to balance a, a life that has work demands and family demands and social demands, and then also find a time to tell these wonderful collaborative stories together. Um, talk to me a little bit about embrace the initiative, and talk to me a little bit about uh, how that how that started. Um, as you began, like, ho like, like hosting and creating these workshops for people to learn how to DM, uh, if you can tell us a little bit of that mm -hmm. story, and then maybe even like one or two of the like tidbit pieces of advice that you offer the most in those workshops. So when I started doing the online, like charity streams and so on, and I was more of a, like a, a view only person for a while. I would come and join a, a stream for a, a game and then I'd just kind of fade to the background to watch what was going on. 
and I was seeing thread after thread about how to be a good DM or how can I be a good DM or what do I need to know to be a good DM? And a lot of it was about the mechanics and a lot of it was so many arguments about what's wrong, what's right, what's the right way and so on. Nobody was talking about the heart. Because in my mind, you are ready to be a DM, a GM, a storyteller, a keeper, whatever they call it in your system, as soon as you want to tell a story with other people. Yes. Hell yes. That's Love when that. you're ready. Um, and so I was sitting up there thinking about different names, and I said, well, you have to embrace the initiative. And because of how my brain works, I broke down each letter in the word embrace as to it is a different uh, element of what the workshop goes over. So we had E, which was every time is your first time. You're never not going to be nervous when you go in to run a story for people. You could be DMing for your first time or you could be DMing for 20 years. Every time you sit down at that table, it is your first time and it's okay. Um, M was meet your players where they are. Mm -hmm. Not every table is going to be for you and you won't be the right DM or GM for every table. But if you meet your players where they are with the safety tools that you've discussed with the themes, they say they'd want to play uh, with everybody on the same page. You have some people that love video game like DMing where it's less about the stories and the characters and it's more about the grind okay mm -hmm. i'm not that good at running games like that but some people are that's what they're interested in that's okay other people get really nervous about mechanics and you have to kind of ease them into it's okay to roll yeah but yeah meeting your players where they are um b was the easiest one for me be the dm or the gm that you'd want to play with oh, each one of these are so good these are uh, so these are really incredible pieces of advice uh that was a huge one for me as someone who has been on the receiving end of you know dms that loved tpks like um not because oh, this is an interesting way to end this, but like taking some kind of macabre pleasure out of making sure they devastate their players. As if I walk away from a table feeling sad or upset or scared, that's not a good experience. <laughs> so it was very important for me to make sure as a DM or GM that I would be someone I'd want to play with, you know? Um, R, rec R was recognize what you know and then be open to learning more. Um, Love that. A was ask questions and be comfortable with the answers you give. Mm -hmm. um, this was an important one. Like I'm always 100% honest with my players. You know, I have neurological damage from medical injuries and sometimes... I will think I have said something, but I have not actually said it. You know, it's a glitch. You know, I'll be describing something and I'll mention a villa, but I actually meant to say valley. And, you know, just like it's okay for me to ask questions of, do you really want to do that? It's okay for you to ask me, is it a house or are you talking about something larger? It's okay. Um, but also, if they challenge you, if you've already answered and say, this is something we don't have, or this is the way that it works. Yeah. It's okay to say, I understand what you're saying. I understand where you're coming from based on these results and based on what has happened. This is the natural result in character actions equals in character consequences. Yes. Yes. Oh man. That is such an important piece of advice to to be comfortable. Well, I think that's the thing, too, is there's something sort of intrinsic in that, which is I think people get in their heads about um, 
the status of mm -hmm. the storyteller gamekeeper and go like, oh, like if my status is to remain unquestioned, I can never make a mistake. I am constantly flubbing my words while I'm DMing, not explaining something correctly, second guessing myself, forgetting what I already said, having to go back and re-describe something that I already described and I forgot. And uh, uh, having that like forgiveness, you, like just because you are running the game doesn't mean that you need to have that thing of like no one ever questions dad you never talk back to dad it's like no like you are allowed to go like oh i messed up or like i didn't describe that the right way or like oh i'm sorry gang let me like backtrack and redline something i did or like oh i actually made a mistake let me like um, uh, I think that is such profoundly good advice for people who might be feeling like as the DM, you're never allowed to make a mistake. No, you, not only are you allowed to, you just will. I do all the time. And you're there playing with your pals and they will understand if you have to go back in and edit something or correct yourself. Um, but I want to let you finish this yeah. incredible acronym. Um, but then I'll go back and touch on something after I finish the acronym because I had to write it explanation to somebody that pretty much encapsulate what you just said um but yeah and see what's change what doesn't work and roll with the story this is this is <laughs> this is what some people find as a, or treat as a bane yeah it's actually really freeing because sometimes i can prepare for something and have an outline ready and have all these locations and stuff written. And it used to really stress me out that I would get to the table, we'd start running it. And even though they were supposed to go find a weapon to deal with the manticores or whatever, they instead decided to bake cookies and set up a camp and um, want to do research into what are feasts that manticores appreciate. You know, they, they could go a completely different direction yeah. than what you had planned or you could try something I had a whole campaign written for a group of people and we got through one or two sessions and there was these awkward these very awkward moments where people were like I don't know what to do I'm not very comfortable and three sessions into a fully fleshed out campaign I came back next week with a new campaign and I said let's try this and that ended up being an amazing like one of my favorites that we ever ran. Um, because if no one's having fun at the table, then it's not really worth it. Um, and the last one, the last E was each time that you GM or DM or really do anything in life, focus on leaving the table a little, a little better than you found it. I love that. That's amazing. Um, uh, uh, leaving to it to you. What does it mean to leave the table better than you found it? So everybody's going through so much, and a lot of the work that I do with accessibility and diversity and inclusion, and I always say you can't have a conversation without about diversity without also talking about accessibility. And there's so many things that people are going through that when they sit down at that table, I want them to like, if they're in 100% pain, right? If by the time we stop playing, they're like one or 2% less in pain than they were when they sat down, or if they've been crying all week and they finally get to laugh, even if it's a soft chuckle, that's what it's about for me that means we've had a good session. And if I never get to sit down with those people again or log on and play with those people again, I know for just a brief moment, just a brief moment, um, that I brought a little bit of joy or laughter to their lives. Oh man, that's really, really good. That is really, really, really good. Um, well, that's like, yeah, I mean, that is the that is the goal, right? There, we're finding like catharsis and release and joy and meaning in these stories that we're all telling together. Uh, that is a 
beautiful uh, sequence of every, I feel like we could spend a whole episode talking about every <laughs> one of those letters. Uh, uh, that's really, really special. Um, uh, yeah, that's, that's remarkable. Um, we, we, I wanted you to, to finish your, your incredible um, sort of breakdown mm -hmm. of what people need to sort of start running these games. Um, uh, but you also said that you, you had something you wanted to go back to and and discuss or refer to a moment ago, and I want to make sure oh, we yeah. don't miss it. Well, that, like, basically that acronym is the workshop. We go through each letter and we talk briefly on it and people ask questions. And with each letter has been assigned a specific stat, like they're filling out a character sheet. And <laughs> by, awesome. so like their strength and dexterity. And by the time they get to it, every time we go after them, they roll the dice to get a stat. And by the end, everybody gets the opportunity to run, like I said, the timer, a three minute kind of random scenario for the other people in the workshop using those sheets. Um, but you know, when there, there's always questions about the, the pressure, like you were talking about, that's on that, the GM. And I remember getting that question over and over again in emails and stuff from people. And I finally just wrote it so I could just copy paste it and send it to people when I said, okay, this is what a game master is. A game master is a player at the table. You bring to that table your strengths and you have to remain humble so that your players can bring their own strengths to that table as well. You are that player at the table who agreed to turn the pages and move the, book, the bookmark. Uh, you are the banker who controls all the other Monopoly pieces that nobody else wanted and reads all the community tests and chance cards. You are basically, and this is gonna get really poetic, but you're basically <laughs> a host of a gala of imagination and creativity, holding tinkling glasses of dice and being immersed in an ambiance of constant improvisation. And your only goal is to tell an amazing story with others and facilitate a very unique level of human to human interaction. Woo! That's it. That is it. That's it. I love that so much because I think that that, I mean, the term, the term like game master or storyteller, all these things like that, it always makes something so singular. But I, again, I've said this before on, on the, the, the show, but like that role is a role of service to your friends and your community in the same way that like cooking everybody a big dinner, being like, hey, come over this weekend. I'm going to be making this dish for everybody. It's like, yes, there I will be doing prep work before you get here. Yes, there, there is, this is a, a little bit more of a labor intensive position, but the idea is not that I am the boss of the dinner when you get here, I am like a host. It's like, you're coming over to my house, I'm hosting you all. And ideally I'm, as a friend, uh, uh, performing this as an act of love. Um, that's so, so wonderful. Uh, uh, I love that. Yeah, and it's like the, the banker of Monopoly. It's like you're do like, yes, like my role is different, but it's only different in service to the game and the story we're all telling. Um, that is so, so wonderful. Um, when you, there's, I mean, again, I truly think we could take any single one of those letters and spend a whole episode just unpacking it. Um, but I also wanted to talk with you about um, uh, a little bit about where your passions lie in terms of running games, because I know, for example, that you um, you talked about having like a 15 page backstory for your characters, which I love so, so much. Uh, and, but you're also saying like, it's, it's an improvisation. You're, you're going, um, you know, you're there to serve what's at the table, which for me is very funny because I feel like one of the things that you and I both adore in terms of that game master position is world building, mm -hmm. which we really, really love. But I also know, like, just like you've said that you're emphasizing the importance of improv and of like taking what you had prepared and throwing it away. If that's not the direction that the PCs want to go in. Um, is that something that you th think um, is 
contradictory or do those impulses go hand in hand? In other words, like if you're if you're the type of person who loves putting all these details in your world and you wrote about the council of wizards that sits, is in the port city has an ancient gene that comes up once every 7 years and delivers a wish to the seven great houses of blah, 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 and you're like yeah I love it I love it I love it does having that desire within yourself conflict with the other part of being a game master, which is to say, yeah, I made all this stuff up, but you guys want to open a tavern, so we're going to do that instead. Are those impulses conflicting, or do they go hand in hand, or do you have to learn how to marry them together? Where I am now, they kind of go hand in hand, mm -hmm. because nowadays, I'll, say, I'll do more prep if I'm running a session in person, Mm -hmm. Then I will if I'm doing one online. Cool. If I'm doing one online, especially if it's like a regular thing and I've got a peop group of people who one might be missing, you know, or two might be missing and I have to kind of change things, but we've got six weeks to get through this, I have, will have written a basic outline for the campaign. I will fill in like major uh, plot points or things that do need to happen to keep the story going. And I may put in like one or two NPCs at this location, one or two NPCs at that location, um, and sometimes have to swap them. Um, but learning to relax about prep helped me so much. <laughs> um, because there was initially that, you know, I just spent two hours working on all of this after work to come straight from that to run this and you want to marry the manticore <laughs> okay <laughs> give me a second um honestly that is the that is the the house words of dungeon yeah. masters everywhere more than anything if i could have a shield that just said give me a second underneath yeah. it in a big flowing banner that's my dm house words yes. um. <laughs> and i challenged myself one thing further especially when i started to agree to dm or gm for conventions mm -hmm. i created a system where i don't get to come in with any prep whoa when I get to the table, everyone takes about 30 minutes to fill out their sheets. And this is real fun process where they write one skill and one item and press it to the person to their left. And by the time it goes all the way around, if you have a full sheet, that's your sheet. Everybody's contributed things. But then my players give me a theme and a time period. And then I run them a two hour, um, one and a half to two hour one shot with the, that information. Um, that's and, incredible. That's like <laughs> that's like a magic trick. That's incredible. And that's we so use, cool. Like either a Jenga tower or a deck of cards for like uh, they get the choice to roll or pull. You know, if they pull and I pull a card that's higher than theirs, um, then you know there's consequences. Or if they roll and they fail, then they have to pull twice and the consequences go up from there. But, um, and those have been some of the, some of them the most heartfelt, like in one of them, I was in tears at the end of it because of somebody's choices. And some of the most laughter filled things I have ever ran. Um, but it was something that I did to help get me out of that rut of I need to be overly prepared. And so when I started doing that, everything else became a breeze. Because when somebody tells you they want to play a, a, a ring of organized criminals in the year 3000, where they use an old fast food restaurant as their hideout, or, you know, we want to be circus performers and we want the time period to be 1940, but Homeboy has an iPod and a bag of Fritos. And you have to turn that into a time traveling adventure where they go back into the 1940s and have to solve, you know, Fibonacci puzzles in order to get back to the present. You learn to relax. Yeah. So like, I can have a setting that's stable 
and like I can do a basic outline and create some dungeons. This is this is cool. I'm just gonna relax. Yeah. That is so, so awesome. And that's it's incredible advice too, because I think that, that there is a I think what you are like like the the how do I put this? It's incredible to think about what parts of improvisation of a storytelling come easily and what parts don't. Because I think all of us understand certain parts of storytelling are like just in our bones to a certain degree. And the things that are difficult are oftentimes figuring out like what is making the PCs motivated to do a certain thing or mm -hmm. why do we care about these people or what is, but to a certain degree, if you say something like we are organized criminals running out of a fast food joint in the year 3000, my head immediately is like, got it. Cool. I don't, you know what? I actually, we can, we can start. Like we're yeah. good to start now. Um, that's so incredible to, to hear that because again, those stories kind of do live in you if you allow yourself to get excited about them. And I think in some ways, you know, it's a funny thing, but I, I've often said before that like the limitations of, uh, one of the reasons that I like uh, s focus so much on improvisation in my own storytelling is that um, preparation. It's this. It's this kind of thing of like I, I have. I have often. There's a cynicism in me about preparation, where it's like it's. So, it's like someone saying like, "Don't worry, we will build a wall." that the storm can't possibly beat down. You know, like our, our ship is unsinkable. Like this prep, we're gonna do prep and the ship will never sink. And no, no matter what, it can't sink. And in my head, I'm like, cool, cool, cool. Because when the iceberg comes along. So it's to me that it's like, it's like <laughs> the difference is rather than learning how to build ships well, uh, I'm just gonna learn how to breathe underwater. And <laughs> there's that like, it, there is an element of, of advising people to embrace the improvisational aspect of running these games that does come from a, a place for me of like deep horror of like the PCs are going to sink your ship. Like put, yeah. Oh, make a flow chart, plan, plan four different flow charts, plan a hundred. They will find the thing you didn't prepare for. And when they do, if you didn't spend any time thinking about stories as a fluid element that you can just travel through, you will be ruined. Um, yes. <laughs> so it's important. I feel like I, it's really, really gratifying to hear you talk about. I, I feel like that's a great practice for people. Like, yeah, if you're someone that relies a lot on prep or is worried about your ability to improv, Try that out. Sit down and be like, okay, what are, like, I'm not gonna do any prep work. Just you guys tell me who you are and what kind of story you're excited to tell. And they go, Haunted Mansion, we're a bunch of teens who got dared to stay in the Haunted Mansion overnight. And you will be amazed as your brain, even with no prep, starts to kick in and go, okay, I'm, you know what? I am familiar here. I'm not that out of my element. Um, God, that's so cool. Uh, uh, I love that. That's amazing. Um, uh, we are we are flying by in terms of time. I want to turn turn us over to some of uh, uh, to some audience uh, some audience questions. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and start start looking for that. Uh, ba -ba -ba. Um, uh, okay, fine, fine, fine. Um, got some other stuff here. Um, uh, oh, here's a fun one. Um, this one's from Splatterkin. Thanks, Splatterkin. Uh, hey, what do you guys think is the best thing to keep in mind or do for a long-term campaign set in a single large location? Thanks for your time. Uh, oh, well, thank you, Splatterkin, for the question. A single large location. Um, well, that's that's a very interesting question. Um, uh, this And this kind of goes back to our world building thing that we were talking about. Honey, for you, when you're doing world design stuff, do you find yourself tending to start sort of cosmic scale and then work your way in? Or do you tend to start a little bit closer to home, more human in like a location or setting that's a little bit more like within the kind of like a smaller scale and then work your way out? So you're talking to the person who created 
a setting based off of how you build a musical stanza. Like, <gasps> the name of the town was Stanza, so I literally built it with three different levels, and there was bass, and then there was, the, like, a area that's, like, the white space, and then there was treble. And for the lines and spaces, there were different locations and so on. So the way my brain works when it comes to world building so cool. That's is usually, so cool. That's usually so around cool. a theme. Like with Clockwork Vines, which is botanical steampunk, I just wanted to use the language of flowers from Victorian times and steampunk. So I built it based on choosing specific flowers and what they mean. And then using the flowers that my players chose and those meanings for the themes to create the alleys or the locations that I built from. So, um, it, it kind of works, you could say, from cosmic in. Because here is my theme, and then here is where Act 1 starts. This is so... I, th this is, this is so helpful and lucid and this is, I, I can't tell you how this is like exact, this is the, this is the same language you're talking about in terms of talking about theme that we used back in teaching um, improv at UCB mm -hmm. of, of talking about game, of talking about the idea of like, uh, because what what is the issue that every dungeon master faces when they're doing their world design is the idea of like can you really make it all up right can you like yeah you named your city do you know all the neighborhoods in it and even if you know all the neighborhoods do you know the names of all the businesses and the institutions and the different parks and if you, even if you know the names can you make up all the stuff like that it's it's always this thing of like how do i fight the the sort of like shadow at the edges of what I've already created. And what you just said of like, it's not about starting macro in the kind of like, at the beginning, there were the 16 gods of order and the 16 gods of chaos, but rather saying, what's the theme of the campaign, right? Uh, because an improv, what we would say is like the purpose of finding a game, meaning the purpose of not, not only knowing that your scene is funny, but knowing why it's funny allows you to go to the next move because when you're doing that improv scene and you, whatever it could be the dumbest game in the world it's like okay what's funny about this scene we're in a courthouse and there's a lawyer who's a regular lawyer and then the other lawyer is a brown bear and that's a grizzly bear lawyer and it's that's the game of the scene and the reason you set that up and you go like okay we know that this is where the jokes are coming from is so that when you go to that second beat or you bring that scene back, that you go, okay, I have some understanding of like, if someone says like, okay, we're not in the courthouse anymore. Now we're in the like, we're in like the city hall bathroom. What's going on as you touch the lawyer in the bathroom? And you go like, okay, well, the, like, do bears go to the bathroom in the forest? Maybe the bathroom is just the forest. Maybe there's, Maybe there's just like a full grown salmon leaping out of the urinals. Maybe there's other stuff happening that is like playing along that game. So when you're talking about composing things on a theme, you're talking about like when you figure out what is the creative driving theme that you kind of figure out your, your overture at the mm -hmm. beginning of the piece, all of a sudden, when you go to somewhere unexpected that you haven't developed, you're not frightened of going there because you're instantly going to know what's there because the world rolls out away from you like mm -hmm. a red carpet. It's like, I know what's going to be there because I know what the, the, the sort of, I guess, DNA of the world is. How many metaphors can I mix in one rant? Um, uh, so many. That's beautiful. Yeah. Talking about that, that, that thematic world building. Um, right. That is so cool. Uh, uh, so, so we've heard a couple. You dropped a couple awesome worlds right there. Just talking about <laughs> botanical steampunk sounds so damn cool. I want to play in one of your worlds so bad. Uh, 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 but they said large space, right? So yes. I'm, I'm trying to think in my brain. I'm like, okay, so you want to set the whole thing and say you're going to stay in a hotel, hmm. you know, or the large space is, you know, um, a cavern. Like, you say large space, and my brain goes a million different places. <laughs> sure, but right. a singular large space, well, then you're going to have to create different, you may use the words themes or elements of what are you going to explore in that space. Is it the different levels? Because you could do a whole thing where there's 10 
you know, levels in this apartment building or this, you know, um, hotel, and they have to go to each one in order to unlock it. That's like what I did with uh, a one shot that I built off of the one, two buck on my shoe um, nursery rhyme. But that whole thing was <laughs> a so central cool. space. But they had to solve riddles behind each door in order to get a key to unlock the next one. So they stayed in the same basic space. But I was able to use that theme, the one, two, buckle my shoe, three, four, shut the door, you know, all of that to create different encounters behind each door that they had to be faced with. So for me, it's about, are you trying to set up for a large campaign, different encounters? And then what are the themes you're going to use behind those encounters so that it never gets stale? I love that i think yeah using using theme appropriately and i think too one thing this is this is going to be we, i feel like we've been talking about big theory stuff this is going to be very like kind of practical tactical kind of you know uh, uh advice um think about genres in other media um that are also single location right um uh, things that are, you know, single location in other media are like often like murder mystery stuff, um, political intrigue. Like if if you think about like, okay, this is going to all occur within like the the capital city of such and such, or it's all going to occur, you know, like um, uh, it's all going to occur in like in one castle. Um, uh, I think to. I ran a setting called Storm City for a long time, which was a kind of no fantasy noir, you know, like uh, gritty sort of like gothic uh, a crime story, um, which was all set in a single city because it was this like Sin City-esque, you know, cosmopolis where it's like the adventures were this sort of rotating cast of characters coming in and out of this single place. So I think that like genre can inform a lot uh, in terms of keeping things in a single location. And if that location um, uh, is even smaller than that, uh, that it is like a single structure, uh, I think what you can think of too is like, um, you know, I remember the, the this is a, a, a funny, weird personal story. My dad uh, was a stand-up comedian for, uh, for all of my, you know, childhood growing up and um, traveled on cruise ships, uh, worked on cruise ships. And I got to like stow away with him uh, on cruise ships going around when I was a little kid. And that's an interesting thing of a location that is a fixed location that still moves from place to place. So doing a D&D &D campaign set on a cruise ship, uh, uh, you know, allows you to have your fixed location campaign, but still have reasons for characters to come and go, reasons for new characters to arrive. Um, so I think that there's a, a lot of fun things you can do with a single location setting. Um, God, I'm thinking about like the original Star Trek and how much it's like, Hey, hey, you know, it's like, it's like, talk about, talk about some wise production choices there. Like, yeah, we're going on a journey to different planets, which is why it's the same bridge at Starship in every episode. Um, uh, you know, a journey, given what your setting can be, can be a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that's awesome. Um, uh, uh, oh, this is very fun. Um, speaking of, uh, uh, here's, here's a uh, fun one from, speaking of murder mystery, from Kayla, a.k.a. Chungle Down Bim. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, oh that poor man. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Incredible. Uh, hi, Brennan. I'm DMing for the first time and running a murder mystery. How do I make clues more obvious for my players? They have an average intelligence of eight and are my very dumb babies. Now, I want you to know, Kayla, a.k.a. Chungle Down Bim, that you did reference your players in the previous sentence of this question. Um, but but I, I, I'm assuming that the, it's the characters that have an average intelligence of eight. Um, uh, uh, I would say... How do I make clues more obvious for my players? Um, well, I think that's interesting, right? Because because obviously, like, there's an element of in-world stuff you can do with, like, investigation checks and um, perception checks and stuff like that. 
Um, I would also point something out here, which is if your players have none of them have made characters that are uh, high wisdom or high intelligence, and none of them have sunk proficiency or expertise into insight, investigation, or perception, do, ha, do they correctly understand that they are about to be in a murder mystery? Because if none of them have a desire to be detectives, you can try to run a murder mystery all you want. You're actually going to be in probably a farce with murders happening in the background um, if no one is interested in solving those murders, uh, which really c comes down to um, something that I think Honey's been saying the whole time that we've kind of been here and is the heart and soul of collaborative storytelling, which is you have to clue your players in on the genre. If we can, we can flash back to Honey on the playground as a little kid being like, you're out of theme. You're all <laughs> operating out of theme. <laughs> Right, because if your players don't know, if your players don't know that they're going to be in a murder mystery, um, I think that you will often be shocked or surprised if they're not, you know, by how much they are looking for actions that fall outside of that genre. Like one of the things about genre that makes it so powerful in terms of developing your stories around it is that it lets us know what kind of moves are expected from us. Um, you know, like if I know I'm in a murder mystery, I will probably do stuff like, you know, hold my pipe out and go like, there's been a murder and do all that fun murder mystery stuff. If I'm just a D and D character and the tropes of a murder mystery start happening, but my character comes from like a high fantasy universe. If I'm playing, I don't know, some like halfling rogue and there's like a body drops to the floor under a crash of lightning. My first move might be, I fucking grab a bunch of silverware, duck out the window and run out of this damn house as fast as I can. You're not pinning it on me, baby. Not this time. As that, as you can imagine, might throw a big wrench into the normal goings on of a murder mystery. Um, honey, what do you think about this? About like pr prepare, like how, like yes, I do want to answer the question about making your clues more obvious. But I think there's another issue here as well about making sure that your players know what to collaborate with you on. So you answered it from the perspective of maybe the players aren't aware of like where their particular, uh, where the story is supposed to go, where you would like it to go in this murder mystery thing. So I'm going to answer it from the perspective of maybe they did, and this is the luck of the roles, so to speak, or they thought it would be amusing somehow to play these characters. Now... One thing that I always say is that I interpret stats based on the character. So if you have an intelligence of eight, your character has an intelligence of eight, but they have a wisdom of like 14, or they're super dexterous, or you've given them this background where they're a professional, you know, person that used to do fighting in gladi gladiator rings. I don't know. I am always going to tailor how I drop clues to what that character may pick up on based on their life experience. Yes, love that. So if I've got an ex, you know, pit fighter who just happened to be at a dinner party and somebody got murdered, well, a professional detective may start looking for fingerprints or this or that. A person who has experience fighting may be automatically notice, well, if this was an accident, then the blade would have come out this direction. But this looks like somebody on purpose stabbed them because of the experience that they may have. So I may have them roll um, something pertaining to uh, health or whatever the system you're using and that makes sense to that character. And I will set up the clues and put. sometimes you have to put those cookies really low on the shelf. Sometimes you have to just... <laughs> put the, yes. the cookies really low on the shelf, make a sign, and just say, okay, here is your next clue. Some players need them. And that's very, very important. You don't have to tell them, the clue is that there is a handkerchief around their neck. You can say, the clue is in something that is on them. 
Gotcha. Yes. Yes, so, yes, yes. For me, this question is a little bit vague in so much as the expectation, like to your point. If people did know they were going to do a murder mystery, then they may not have known how to roll these things. Or they may have rolled up their character, sat down at the table, and you start running an adventure. Um, but my advice would be tailoring the roles or the expectations to the background of the characters. I think that is incredibly, incredibly wise. And I think also there's something in there of what people want when they roll well in any game. The reason that rolling well feels good is when it affirms your character's identity, right? Mm -hmm. That's like, why, like, why do you want to roll the nat 20 against the big boss in the final fight? Yeah, you want to beat the boss, but also it affirms your vision of your character as being this heroic warrior, right? Mm -hmm. Which is why if you're playing a big detective and you want, to, you want to hit that nat 20 on that investigation check so you can do the fabulous deduction and do the, you know, the, the Sherlock Holmes thing, do the whole like, aha, well, only a bit of dust from a coal mine only to be found in the far reaches of Bavaria or whatever, right? Um, mm -hmm. So it's about affirming those character choices. And I think that what you should, there needs to be collaboration here. And again, there's a, there's a big difference between, because there's two different problems here. If people have all made characters, none of whom want to be serious investigators, it's possible that you need to rethink this adventure a little bit. Mm -hmm. It's possible that if none of them want to be master competent investigators, maybe you should be running a comedy murder mystery. Maybe you're not doing Hound of the Baskervilles. Maybe you're doing Clue. You know, <laughs> Maybe you're doing something a little bit different uh, where people are kind of being bozos and running around and like goofing around or messing up and falling into the right answer almost by mistake, um, which is fine as well. If it's just a matter, like Honey is saying, of like your players really are not down for this genre in terms of like they're not big puzzle solver, clue hunter type people in general. By the way, that often can be can be distracting in the reverse. I have definitely played characters that shouldn't have been big clue head puzzle solvers. I feel like uh, in, in our core uh, seasons, Zach Oyama has played a lot of like sort of like brawny himbo characters. And Zach IRL is like a very brilliant puzzle, like always, can, not only is he good at like puzzles and clues in general, but it has like a bizarre talent for guessing my plots way ahead of the curve. Uh, always knows what like I specifically am up to. Um, but has often played characters, and I can see Zach struggle with that sometimes of him being like, okay, like, is, am I sitting next to someone whose character actually has a high investigation that I can like give this thing I figured out to? Um, but that's what I would say is, is if your players are coming to you and they're like, hey, we get stressed out around finding clue stuff altogether, um, I think it's acceptable for you to be like, okay, let's structure this in a way that's gonna be maximum fun for everybody. And if you guys are all okay with with us kind of like, like you're saying, honey, of like putting, putting a little bit of a neon sign, right? And that neon sign can go on any number of things. That neon sign can go on a scene. It can be like, hey, letting you guys know in this scene, a clue has come up. You can put it on the clue itself and be like, hey, you, and, and by the way, most DMs already do this. Like, I don't know if you guys have noticed this, but if everyone intuitively knows, if you walk into a room, if I'm narrating a scene and I go, um, you walk into this cavern deep under the, the sort of seaside cliffs, moss hanging from the damp stone overhead, you see driftwood and spars, and a strange chest on a dais raved above with an emblem of a roaring lion on the surface. No PC is going to be like, what's up with this moss? It's like the thing that's clear. Or they might. Knowing my players, they, they might. Um, uh, just to torture me. Um, mm -hmm. But the point being, like, I, as the DM, by putting a lot of extra mustard on that chest at the very end, 
maybe even by just describing it last have kind of indicated where the clue is. But you also are welcome to go like, also there's a clue in that chest. Yeah. Um, because even doing that doesn't necessarily ruin the fun of putting the clues together. Um, you're still absolutely able to do that. Um, this is such a fun question. And I, again, coming back to, I do love that idea of if no one is taking an investigation, can you use their other skills? Like I would say, yeah, if, like you're saying, if there's, a, if there's a clue to glean from someone's combat knowledge, maybe allow them to use an attack role as a knowledge check in that mm -hmm. moment, right? Um, uh, you know, you have, even if you have no wisdom or intelligence in the party, maybe there's someone with a high enough charisma that they can learn clues just through people gossiping with them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's like, oh, people just tell me all kinds of stuff all the time because I'm just fun to talk to. Um, what a what a uh, what a wealth of uh, information uh, from that from that question. Um, I love that. Uh, uh, this next question comes to us from George. Thanks, George. Um, any advice for a brand new GM leading brand new players? For example, uh, how should I tackle character creation? What happens in a session zero? Uh, great question, George. <laughs> Honey, looking around the room. Uh, uh, well, this is great, and I don't think there's. I don't think this is a one size fits all answer to this probably uh it's probably whatever works best for you and your players but i think there are some basics that are really good to go for, for in terms of character creation what happens in a session zero honey what do you what are what are your go-to's for character creation and a session zero um uh in the instances where those are the same thing or in the instances where those are two separate processes so this always depends on whether or not I'm playing with people who have played tabletop RPGs or not. Mm -hmm. um, I actually have, and it goes out in the workshop or whatever, I had someone ask me, can you write me up a list of things that you do in your session zero? And I kind of wrote that up and I share it with people. But the high level is knowing your players and knowing your table is always where I start. I start with the player first and then I build out the character from there. So my session zero starts with, okay, have you ever played before? Yes or no, that's fine. What kind of story are you interested in? What story you're not interested in? We cover lines and veils or any safety tools that we use before anything else because that often drives what I know I need to avoid in a story. If someone has a severe phobia of spiders, I may have made parts of my plot arachnid focused. <laughs> right. And I'll have to kind of take a step back and go, okay, so depending on how severe they will describe it, I may say, hey, is it specific aspects of spiders? And if they say, well, it's not the spider itself, it's, you know, things with a lot of legs. I say, okay, I can, could you handle it if it was just webs? I won't ever do X, Y, and Z. And we'll have those open conversations in our session zero. I will also, and I will stress this to any new or existing DM or GM, you are a player at that table, so you have a right to have lines and veils of your own. Yeah. And if you don't know what a line and veil are, at a very high level, lines and veils are safety tools used where you have um, concepts, themes, um, certain things that you just don't mind happening in the world, but don't want to see on screen, that would be a line. Mm -hmm. um, a veil or thing, well, I may have mixed that up. Caffeine. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think I did mix that up. But anyways, lines and veils. One of them is the things that you want to have see off screen. And the other one are the things that you don't want in there at all. So the lines are the things you do not want in your world at all. The veils are things that are okay with happening off screen, but you don't want them to actually be active in role play. Um, I think it's important for both the players and the DMs to get these uh, established from the get-go. And you can keep them as anonymous as you want, but I think it's important for every other player to know what lines and veils are on the table as well, so that they don't introduce those themes or concepts. Then from their character creation, start if it's people who've never played before 
sometimes because you have people who have different neurodivergent situations, people who have ADHD, people who really have a hard time focusing on things unless something active is taking place. And oftentimes I will make character creation part of a role play. Like their first session, they will get to roll dice and play and create their character at the same time. I have written introduction scenarios where that's how it is. Oh, you wake up and you first you notice that your hands are bound or this or that and they get to roll for their strength. And you feel yourself falling and they get to roll for their dexterity and they get to create their characters and still feel like they're playing as they go along. Um, so yeah, for me, character creation can happen that way. Online, it's hard. Online, I have the hardest time helping people create their characters because you've got to get a digital character sheet. You've got to set all this time up and I can't lean over their shoulder and help them in that way. Um, but yeah. That is, uh, so that is so, I, I love the idea of incorporating lines and veils prior to character creation, because obviously like by the time the characters are already, already created, you want, you want that knowledge pre-existing of what themes should or shouldn't go into something because it might directly relate to the nature of the character that someone's playing. Uh, someone's intense arachnophobia is going to have a real hard time if someone else has made a Dryder character. Uh, shout out to Erica Ishii who uh, uh, <laughs> made that uh, made Lilith Spider Mom. Um, uh, but um, I want to underline as well. I think this is a really smart idea. Also, George, for your question, uh, session zero is also a great time to set those lines and veils to do if you are doing character creation all together, whether virtually or physically. Uh, if you're doing it together physically, please do so safely wear a mask um, uh, and stay six feet apart. But that'd be a fun <laughs> socially isolated. Why'd you roll for your hit points? Um, uh, but uh, the idea of, uh, there also is a great thing, I think, to set here, not only for lines and veils of these personal safety tools, but also like expectations for your game and safety tools for the game as a group as well. I think great things to discuss in a session zero are what do we do if a player has to miss a session? That comes up all the time. Mm. It, it, is someone else going to be responsible for that player? If so, are they responsible for them only in combat? Or do they are they saying lines of dialogue to that character? Do we NPC that character? Do we have a that character like magically vanishes if the player can't make it? Um, uh, I think you set those things up. Uh, uh, in a session zero so that people have something to rely on and there's that sort of communal contract there with the group. Um, and I think too that you can, one of the nice things about a session zero too, because obviously I, much like Honey, want to like get playing as quickly as possible. So I'm like, yeah, let's like roll dice, let's tell a story. Um, but it's also, I think, can be very good to, to sometimes cordon these out, like, Character creation is separate from a session zero, which is separate from your first session one, um, especially because some of that stuff can be a marathon, like, like, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, so, and especially in terms of accessibility, um, uh, whether a person is neurodivergent or just needs breaks for any some, some number of reasons. Like uh, if you're gonna have one of those like marathon sessions where you like intro the breaks. world, breaks, very good to have breaks. People got to use the restroom. People need to just unwind. Maybe people, I'm one of those people that definitely needs like little phone unwind time if my brain is like going on all cylinders. Uh, and also snacks. Oh, I can't, I, I, get, I get roasted online because I don't even wait for breaks to snack. Uh, I'm snacking on camera all the time. Uh, but snacks, very important. We have human bodies that have needs uh, uh, and it's, using your planning to take that into account will help everybody have the best time possible. Um, uh, so I think if you're going to do one of those m monster kind of sessions where you do like world intro character creation and first session all in the same day, just be cognizant of people's physical and mental limitations in doing yep. so. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on, cause you mentioned it and it'll be very quick. Uh, one topic that really doesn't get discussed that much in session zeros, but I started to make it a huge point, is character death. Sometimes characters will decide, players will decide that they no longer want to be playing a character anymore. They come to you, they say, I'd like to go out with a bang, and as a DM, you're working with them to set up that scenario. 
I always ask my table, if somebody makes this decision that they would like a character killed off for whatever reason, would you all want to know that this is planned ahead of time? Or are you okay with rolling with it out the blue? And I say this is important that sometimes it may come across as a spoiler, but I think a lot of DMs have been in the situation, at least I have, where somebody wants their character to die, but everybody is struggling to save them. And when you as a DM have to keep putting in complications to make that harder and harder, now there's sometimes a lot of frustration, people get super emotional and it's no longer fun for people. Because like, I have this, I could do that, da, 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 da. And I've had to like go to the player and said, hey, they don't know. Do you want me to tell them? Do you want to tell them so we can go on? And I've had some tables say they're okay with the mystery. And you had other people that say, well, I would prefer to know. You don't have to tell me any details or so on. I'm still gonna act in character, but I would just prefer to know so that as a player, I am not emotionally drained, shocked, or feel like I have failed in some way. That is such incredibly good advice. Uh, uh, player character death is very intense. Yes, we it is a game. Yes, we are telling a story about made up uh, fictional characters. It's very, very intense. Player character death is very, very intense. Uh, and setting those expectations up early is such a good piece of advice. Uh, and I think what I love there in your advice too, honey, is the idea that like, yeah, people are attached to more than just their own character. Like I have had players that were way more rocked by the death of one of their teammates than they were by their own character's death. Um, so I think that that is something that's really, really wise uh, uh, and everyone would do well to again, talk about that early on. And like every one of these boundary setting things, I think the important thing is that a session zero is just, is good to talk about these things because it's the first opportunity to talk about them and start making that good practice. Session zero is not like you guys are ratifying a legal document. If people's minds or hearts change and someone comes to you later and is like, actually, I've thought about it. I do want to know if someone is planning a character death. Obviously, uh, uh, in, within the nature of consent is the idea that a person can change their mind and that yeah. becomes the new reality at any point in time. Um, so uh, I think that's an important thing to set up in session zero as well as like, hey, we're setting up these lines and veils. We're setting up these expectations surrounding character death and how we handle if a player has to miss a session. But this is just our first opportunity to have this conversation. This conversation, like all good conversations, is ongoing and things can be changed if your uh, heart or mind changes at any point in the process. Um, heck yeah. Um, uh, let's see here. Uh, this next question comes to us from Amber Dahl. Thanks, Amber. Uh, uh, I'm a therapist interested in a court. I think we had a similar question. I hope I'm not doing the same question I did last time. I think this is a different question. If it's the same question that I did a couple months ago, uh, I'm sorry, but it's a very good question. So if it gets answered twice, so be it. Um, this one's from Amber Dahl. Uh, I'm a therapist interested in incorporating TTRPGs into play therapy. What is your or your guest's experience in using role-playing games in a therapeutic setting? And what have you learned about crafting therapeutic narratives? Huge fan of Adventuring Academy. So excited to see its return. Thanks, Amber. Um, uh, big old caveat here, as I think I've said in the past, I am not a therapist. I am not a licensed mental health professional. Uh, I don't, uh, uh, and, and you know, unless your dungeon master is a licensed mental health professional, uh, they should not attempt therapy uh, on their friends. However, if we understand therapeutic to be a small t therapeutic, meaning like, have I ever used tabletop role playing games to like, work through stuff in my life in the way that we are all working through stuff in life and in the way that like we all use stories to deal with the world and our place in it uh, uh so in that small t therapeutic i think yes absolutely and uh uh even before getting to the idea of like therapeutic narratives in stuff um uh, uh i think there's something inherently therapeutic just about the nature of 
collaborative storytelling with people that you love and trust. Uh, that is my my like uh, way of dealing with the complexities of life and and uh, uh, you know the working through those things with people that I love and trust and care about. Um, and certainly, I, honey and I were like talking a little bit about this before the cameras were rolling, but I feel like my we both started playing games like this when we were very young. I definitely used uh, gaming and tabletops uh, to work through a lot of stuff when I was like a kid and when I was a teenager and try to find those heroic narratives early on to make sense of uh, an at times very frightening world. Um, uh, honey, what do you think uh, about the, the, the uh, therapeutic applications of uh uh, tabletop role-playing games. Um, it reminds me, I did one Embrace the Initiative workshop and someone showed up early, had his notebook and everything, and he um, sat at the table and he said he had, he was a member of a group of individuals with PTSD who used tabletop role-playing um, as what they did when they got together and that their old DM was leaving and that he was going to have to take up the position. So he wanted to learn a little bit of what the tips and tricks that I had for DMing um, so that he could take it to his group. Um, and the approach that I had taken about it being about the heart more than the mind and being caring and adjusting and everything else like that seemed to be something he could really vibe with. Um, To Brennan's point, I am not a mental health professional. I am a cybersecurity professional who actually goes to talk to schools and children, but I do cover things like cyber bullying. You know, I have talked to teenagers um, before because the rates of um, domestic abuse and so on using virtual forms these days have made all of this even worse. So mm -hmm. I get to talk a lot about positive things that you can do and engage with, um, still have that human connection, but not being in abusive situations. Um, and I have used tabletop RPGs or me even being someone who plays games as a way that people I've been mentoring or girls in groups who will come up to me and be like, hey, you play tabletop RPGs? That's pretty cool. Uh, I'm trying to start something at my school. Uh, do you have anything you could send me? And these are girls with severe anxiety and all kinds of things that they're going through. Um, and so in that way, I have been able to make myself more vulnerable by sharing something that makes, that brings me joy and it makes me more approachable by people who are still struggling to find out how to cope day to day with whatever struggles they may face. Um, so in that way, I think I've kind of ran that parallel of the therapeutic. Um, yeah, I mean, I cried in front of thousands of people on a virtual <laughs> thing without planning, just telling people to be kind. Um, but I would not have had that platform without tabletop RPGs. I think that is incredibly well said. And, and not only that, but like, yeah, finding that vulnerability and, and finding that shared community through storytelling. I think it's very hard to divorce storytelling from the power of community. Uh, uh, I think they're, they definitely, they want to go hand in hand. Right. Um, we, we do uh, develop shared community over our stories. And that's one of the most beautiful things about tabletops is the degree to which you can unite a group of people around this shared narrative. I mean, the strength of friendships that I have that are forged in that in those play worlds together is so very, very real. And um, in terms of in terms of crafting therapeutic narratives. I never set out to craft something that therapeutic. I, mean, I never sitting down like, oh, how do I like 
take it upon myself to like heal my friends. I don't have the skill set or the knowledge. I'm frankly not that smart to be able to put that together. But I definitely have have uh, uh, set out to be like, okay, like can we make something that deals with a theme that I keep getting stuck on in my head? Mm-hmm. Like I think there's definitely a lot of psychodrama elements to like the forest of the Nightmare King in, in mm-hmm. sophomore year. When I do that stuff, it's it's never from, I think the reason that I, I balk at the word therapeutic is that I never am the storyteller am like, let me heal in this moment. <laughs> it's always like, hey, I'm trapped in this too. Like I keep coming back to this as well as a storyteller. Like um, my perspective on the nightmare forest is like, that's a place that I have spent a lot of time. And I think all of us have spent a lot of time. And maybe if we, we all trust each other and we all go there to tell a story, we'll find something out together. Um, which I don't think of as really being the same as therapy, but I do think that that is that a big thing that is absent a lot in our lives, in the modern world where, where there is this sort of plague of like isolation and loneliness and we can feel totally separate. We can feel disconnected from the rest of our human family by a lot of systems that seem just like elder, you know, elder God, larger than the cosmos systems that like keep everybody separated from one another. Um, I think that there is something very special or powerful about um, going into a story together uh, uh, to find out how we all feel about something. Um, And also the degree to which choices don't, like the stakes are often very high in real life. If, If you make a choice to be vulnerable, if you make a choice to trust somebody, if you make a choice to be brave, if you make a choice to do the heroic thing. Uh, and a lot of times, especially for young people, we ask them to make these choices in these things that feel so impossibly high stakes. Uh, and to a certain degree, like there is an element of play, which is practice. I saw that all the time when I was doing LARP camp stuff of like, okay, we're going to ask these kids to grow up and be heroic adults. Have they had opportunities to practice being heroic? Do they know what that's going to feel like? Do they know what that's going to look like? Do they? Is there some idea of what that could be? Uh, so I, I don't know. I, I think to, in my own personal life, like that's the most therapeutic thing the games brought to me when I was a kid was it's all well and good to just be like, go out there and be a good person. Um, but so often like... Um, we do that in, in abstract. And I think in a certain way, telling these first person narrations where you're living as a hero lets you go like, cool, I, here's a little bit of play pretend to get into that headspace. Um, that's how I feel. Maybe that's an overly yeah. romantic, uh, maybe that's an overly romantic uh, notion of it, but that's how I feel. Um, uh, awesome. I think we have time for maybe one more question here. Uh, 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 let's see. Um, uh, this one comes from Aaron. Thanks, Aaron. Um, how do you feel about PCs choosing to work against the party from the beginning? <gasps> Traitor! Uh, how do you, honey, how do you feel about, about players working against their party from the beginning? So... A lot of the campaigns I run, because, you know, of the main struggle, there's man against man, man against God, man against nature, man against himself, and so on. I always find the more interesting narratives to be the man against nature, man against himself, man against God, these concepts like that, as opposed to man against man, because people do that all the time. Like, that's a story that is constantly told. And what I have found, and I'll bring up Clockwork Vines, is that my definition of somebody working against the party from the beginning changed. Because I used to think it would be this one person who's really just out for themselves. Instead, we have two people that could not stand each other in character but loved each other out of character. So that brought a comedic element so they could be in the middle of a fight against this, you know, bronze root that's moving like a snake 
and they're having a full-blown argument, calling each other names, threatening to kill each other, but having to focus on this other thing. That was a player versus player situation that never escalated to a point where it could negatively impact the narrative flow for everyone else. If you were playing a game with political intrigue, or you were playing a game where those are the type of characters that will fit into your story, then having that conversation from the beginning in your session zero, that you don't have to say who's going to do it. You can't, don't have to say who it's going to be. Some groups are not okay with PVP. They're not. Mm -hmm. um, and if I'm with a group that says, hey, I'm not good with PVP, and somebody comes to me with a character that I know is going to probably incite PVP, I'll say, let's find a different way to interpret a self-interested character who is only out for themselves or is a spy or whatever it is. And I will work with them to make it fit in a way that everybody still feels safe. Um, I don't mind them, personally. Yeah. Um, I think that... May, uh, yeah, the question is just sort of how we feel about this. And I would say that, like, the way I feel about it is, is um, players have to agree. Characters don't. Yep. Um, uh, but also, I think we all know and have played with a player who was using their character as a front to be problematic and difficult mm -hmm. IRL, um, which, you know, is is always transparent. And I think you can just call that person out. That's the funniest thing about, about moments like that is oftentimes these people will be like, how did you, it's like when a kid, you walk into a room and there's like a broken vase and like a little kid in there. And then you're like, what happened in here? And they're like, someone else ran in and pushed it. And you're like, no, you're lying. That's not true. It's like that same type of like obvious lie is what people are like, what? Like, I thought it would be cool. It's what my character would do. And you're like, yeah, is that why every other of the adults in this room is pissed off and having a bad time? Like the proof's kind of in the pudding, man. Like it's like, it clearly was not fun. People didn't like it. Um, but I've seen many, like, like, you know, one of the rules of improv that we often talk about, that's like a, a baseline rule is like when you fight in a scene, it becomes bad. But what's so funny is that our students would always come back and say, but I saw these master improvisers fighting and it was really funny. And then you have to explain the deeper rule, which is really like, yeah, you did see those master improvisers in a fighting scene and it was really funny because those master improvisers know how to agree with and lift each other up and mm -hmm. exalt in each other's choices while their characters are being nasty as hell. Mm -hmm. They're so proficient at having the person-to-person -person dialogue and using irony to even as their characters are being horrible to each other, they are still celebrating each other's choices and it's very clear that they each love what mm -hmm. the other person is doing literally kind of like a agree to disagree where you go like okay us and our two characters plus our game master plus all the other players have all agreed as players that having a, a character rivalry here is super fun and we actually love it and you will see that as long as those player choices are being honored even if the characters are working across purposes uh there should be a lot of joy in it for everybody yeah uh the trick comes through, as we've said, um, when it's clear that the players are acting in bad faith. And if you are, um, if you are asking, like, how do I tell when the player is acting in bad faith versus when the characters? Are acting... <laughs> I just made, yeah, you'll know if you feel bad all the time when it's happening, the player's acting in bad faith. Yeah. Um, uh, it's I, You don't need to, you, this is not a court of law. You don't mm -hmm. need to be able to prove it to a jury of your peers. If it's not, if no one's having fun, something needs to change. Um, so uh, uh, that and would... I was going to say, and I'll say to that, and as a DM or a GM, you do have the ability, like I said, to say no. Yeah. You say, hey, they just fell. Can I pick their pocket? Why would you do that? I have had sessions where I've just stopped. I say, for what reason would you have to pick the pocket of somebody that would just give you the money when they're conscious? 
I just think it'd be funny. Can I take all their clothes off while they're unconscious? No. Yeah. I just think it'd be fun. No. You, that is extremely well put. And I think you can talk about that in the moment mm -hmm. of uh, of just be, yeah, like that is a, a good no, because again, you're not saying no to a choice being made in good faith. Um, there, there are moments this is you now. This is. I'm gonna go. This might be. A, this might be a hot take. Um, but in those moments where I think you really are addressing a player, you're like, come on. Like this is. You're clearly doing this to mess with the other player in in this sort of like very you know like confrontational kind of way. Um, I think it's it's as a DM you can say number one like, hey, come on. You're being like a bit of a jerk in this moment to this other person. And I think number two is this thing of like, uh, of being like, I, don't, I also don't think you should feel bad as a DM because it honestly, in a lot of those moments, it breaks the believability of the world, which is obviously second priority to the real feelings of the people at the table, which is always the first priority. But it's one of those things where it's like, your character wouldn't pickpocket from them in this moment. You make camp with them every night and have for the past X amount of years. If you wanted to steal from them and bail, you would have done it in any of the nights previous to this for all this time. Like, it does. in addition to you being a jerk right now, it also doesn't make any sense within the world most of the time people are doing these bad faith moves. Um, that's great advice. I love it. Uh, we have run well over time. I've been having a delightful time talking with you today, honey. It's like such a pleasure and an honor. Uh, like hearing about your like world design, I want to play it in one of your worlds so badly. <laughs> no pressure. If a, but if a chair ever opens up, please holler at me and let me know. Um, uh, the uh, uh, it was such a joy to have you on the show today. Um, uh, and uh, please go uh, check out Honey uh, at Honey and Dice on Twitter. Uh, uh, and go uh, listen to uh, Tea with Honey. Uh, honey, thank you so much. Been an absolute pleasure. Woo! Uh, and for everyone at home, thank you so much for watching, and we will catch you all next time on Adventuring Academy! Ah! Woo! -hoo -hoo!